Okay, welcome back. Um, today we'll look at caches. Um, caches are really core to the performance of a computer system, but they have more implications than just performance, and that's why I'm covering them here. Um, so, specifically, we'll go through why do we bother having caches, or why do computer architects bother having caches, because that's they built them, not me. Um, and then have a look at how they work in detail. And importantly, this is why we're doing them, covering them here is what, what is the effect of, on software? And then we'll have a look at sort of some specific caches, right? Cool. So, basic idea of caches. Why do we have caches? Yeah, can we be a bit more specific? Everything. Everything in operating systems is either about performance or security. <laughs> right. So what's behind that is what's called a memory wall. So um, this is a curve that stretches out for quite a while, and it shows the bandwidth of memory versus the bandwidth of data with which the CPU um, consumes or produces data. And you can see generally the CPU bandwidth is higher. Now with the end of more slow scaling about 10, 15 years ago, the CPU curve flattened out. So maybe that's an issue of the past. Well, not really because at the same time things were going multi-core. And if you look at the total bandwidth produced by the CPU across all cores, it's still going up with pretty much the same slope. And that means the gap between CPU speed, the width, speed with which CPU consumes and produces data, and the speed with which memory can access data is widening by about 18% a year. So that's quite a steep exponential growth. And so that means there's no sign that this problem is going to go away. CPUs are way faster than the memory can handle, and that's what the, why we have uh, caches. So the idea is we have... Um, the CPU, which is on chip, and then we have um, some caches on or off chip between the CPU and main memory. And what makes caches work? Why, why? So basically, we have this sort of slow main memory, and we have the fast CPU, and we have a cache, which is some memory in between the CPU with access that's sort of between CPU speed or close to CPU speed and memory speed, but it's much smaller because very fast memory is expensive in terms of chip real estate, etc. So that's a nice theory if the data that we need is in the cache, right? If not, then the cache is useless. So what makes caches work? Policy. Policy. Poli no? Central exactly. It's the principle of locality. That's a very old established principle, and it's the reason why virtual memory paging works, right? Demand paging. Um, it's program behavior tends to have very strong temple and spatial locality. So temple locality means um, anything I accessed at one stage, I'm very likely to access in the near future, and spatial locality means data I access now, data in its vicinity with, sim with addresses nearby are likely to be accessed in the future. And that's really what makes caches work. So if we had no, no locality, then caches would be utterly useless. And in fact, modern CPUs, to get anywhere near their peak performance, you basically have to have hit rates in the cache of over 99%. So basically, almost all accesses need to find their data in the cache. And that's how you can um, bridge this huge speed differential. So the idea is, yes, um, if you load something, then if, if you access something, you load it in cache. You don't just load the data itself, but you load the whole cache line, so more. That means making use of spatial locality by um, loading neighboring data as well. And then the chances of a near future access finding data live in the cache, that's a cache hit, is pretty high. Um, so 90% is pretty... Con um, optimistic, I think, with 90% locality, you don't get really anywhere near the full performance. It's closer to 99 these days. Um, and so what's behind, what's supporting the spatial locality is this idea that you have different access granularity. The CPU accesses memory in byte or word units. So that's typically 
1 to 8 bytes, sometimes 16 bytes, whereas the cache accesses data in broader units. And so the idea is when you bring something in the cache, not just the byte that's immediately accessed by the CPU, but a whole cache line of 32 or 64 bytes. Why does that work? There's another interesting thing behind it. Just locality itself doesn't cut it because the assumption here is fetching a whole line is, does not take much longer than fetching a single byte. Otherwise, you wouldn't gain anything, right? So what's behind that is that the cost of fetching something from memory has several components. It's uh, the sort of so-called memory transactions. They have an ax and a setup time and a transfer time. And the setup time only depends on the address. It's only needed once. And the transfer time, obviously, is in first order linear in the amount of data. So if the setup time is much bigger than the transfer time, which is typically the case, then by fetching more data at the same time, you amortize the setup time and therefore get a net gain. So that's behind this. And of course, what it really then the cache does is it reduces the number of memory transactions needed. If you fetch something, it's in a cache, you don't have to go to memory. If you, write, if you modify data, write, it gets written back to the cache and not immediately to memory, and that cuts down on memory transactions. And this then ideally will match the memory speed to the CPU speed because you have fewer transactions. So that's really what makes caches work. So locality on reads and clustering on writes. Um, so the, the cache line is the unit of allocation, meaning the unit with which data, data gets allocated in the cache. The cache is of memory, and so um, accessing, allocating anything there allocates a line of the time, and it's also the unit by which data gets fetched from the main memory. And um, per line, it has some metadata to keep track of things. First, you obviously need a valid bit. You need to be able to distinguish does this line hold well the data or not. Um, it needs typically a modified bit because you need to know whether the data is dirty or not. If it's dirty, it can't just be discarded. It needs to be written back to memory. Otherwise, you lose updates. Whereas if it's clean, then it can just be tossed without losing anything. Um, it's got a, got a tag, which we'll see in a moment what it's there for. And then there is... Um, Typically, um, you need some statistics with some, something that drives a state machine for cache replacement. I'll talk about cache replacement in a minute. So this should be all pretty straightforward. Any questions about it? Good. Then, um, how does cache access work? Well, caches can be accessed in different ways. And that depends where they sit in the computer hierarchy in the whole system architecture. So we, ha we have the CPU. And does this work? Uh -huh. Yes. So we have the CPU, and it then fetches data from memory via the cache. And depending on whether we access the cache with a virtual address or the physical address, we have a virtually or physically indexed cache. And um, why is this distinction? Well, anything on core is basically virtual addresses. The CPU issues virtual addresses only. So that's immediately what you get. Memory, of course, is organized in physical addresses. So eventually, you have to get to physical addresses. And of course, the MMU does that. The memory management unit, it tra translates the virtual to the physical addresses. Um, and the question is, OK, do you use the raw address that can, comes from the CPU to access the cache? That's the virtual index cache. Or do you get the physical address once it's gone through access translate, uh, address translation? Then you have a physical address cache. Why would you use one or the other? Sure, because we have the address already, right? Whereas with a physically addressed cache, we need to translate first. OK? Why would you use physical address caches? RAM physically addressed. Hmm? RAM physically addressed, you can't. Um, it's going to interface more directly with RAM. Sure, you need a physical address, right? But why do we only just work with virtually addressed caches? You don't. You don't have the information to answer that yet, so it's OK not to know. We'll see in a second, OK? So um, the virtual address cache, because it 
doesn't need address translation can work in parallel with the address translation, uh, making it faster, as you correctly observed. And um, whereas the physically addressed cache needs the address and, uh, translation. And in pretty much all modern systems, except really small microcontrollers, you have a hierarchy of caches. So you typically have at least an L1 and an L2. Your Odroid has an L1 and an L2. Um, and remember the architecture diagram I showed you last week. It has a private L1, so the L1 is per core, and a shared L2, and that's a typical configuration. Uh, generally, there's up to four levels of caches. Standard, most Intel um, processes these days have three levels of caches, and we generally refer as the last level of cache, the one that's closest to memory. Now I have this claim here, only the L1 may be virtually addressed. Why is that? This is not a law of nature. This is more a engineering practicality. Why would that be? We're not even looking at multi-core at this stage. It's, that's independent on whether you're a single or multi-core. Is there something to do with temporal locality? It's, it's, stopped no, stopped it's, it's, it's a simple practicality. The main advantage of the virtually addressed cache is you don't need to wait for the MMU. You only access the, second, the level 2 cache if you have a miss in the L1. By the time you realize you have a miss in the L1, you have the result of the address translation. So there's no benefit from using a virtually addressed case further down. That's why it's only, if only, and these days they've gone out of fashion, actually. Um, but if there's a virtually addressed cache, it's the L1. Did you have a question? OK. So that's, that's sort of the general background. Where it gets interesting now is how does actually the lookup work on the cache, what we call indexing. That's really the, lo the lookup. So the cache is basically an array of cache lines. So. We already said the cache is organized in lines. So the unit of allocation as well as transfer to memory is the line. So it's basically a bunch of lines and it's an array of those. And we distinguish inside the cache between lines and sets. And basically a indexing operation, which is computing where in the cache we are looking for the data, um, that leads to, in general, not to just one line, but to multiple lines that's called a set. So a set is a multiple lines that are accessed at the same time with the same index operations. And depending on how big these sets are, we have different cache structure. So the, in principle, we have the, the cache structures, the address we're using, whether it's virtu virtual or physical, into three parts. The, the lowest order of the bits are obviously the offset inside the line, right? The line is, say, 32 bytes. And therefore, the, the place where we are in the line is determined by the lowest order bits. These are the, byte, the line offsets here. And then, in principle, the rest of the bits in the address are used for computing the index. But in practice, um, this needs to be... So it, Generally speaking, you hash the rest together to compute the index. But in practice, this is uh, implemented in hardware, which means in order to make it fast, it needs to be real simple. And in almost all cases, this is just taking the lowest order bits of what's left. And that's the structure shown here. So you have the, um, the byte index at the end. And then the next order bits, and that depends on the number of sets. So obviously, log two of the number of sets would be the set index, and this is then just used to index into this array of sets. So the, the view then is the cache is an array of sets, and each set is an array of lines. Okay, And as I said, different caches depend, uh, distinguish between what, how many lines you have in a set. And then there's a tag. Why do you need a tag? The set's not large enough to hold every line in Yeah. The whole point of the cache is it's small, so it's fast, right? So it can't possibly hold all the addresses that map onto a particular cache set. And therefore, you need to know, is the line you're looking for actually in the cache? And that's what you get from the tag. So the tag is matched about the unused bits of the address. And if they're, if they're equal, then we have a match. And then we know this is the line we're looking at. And then we use the byte offset to 
index into that line, and then we have the word we're after. Okay? And um, <clears throat> so that's what I just said. Okay, so now I said, depending on how, how big your sets are, you get different kinds of caches. Um, and this is basically by saying, okay, we have, if we have set sizes of one, then we talk about a direct map cache, in which case the set concept doesn't really exist, right? You have an index, you immediately point to a line, and, that's, and you either have a heat or a miss. If you have multiple lines in a set, then that's a set associative cache. And if you only have one set, then it's a fully associative. So I'll go through all these in uh, detail. Um, in principle, if you have a low associativity, particular direct map, you have a high um, degree of conflicts. So, um, and therefore, your cache um, efficiency tends to be degraded. You reduce your hit rate. Whereas the other extreme, the fully associative cache, it doesn't have any conflicts. Uh, it's only capacity limited, but it's slow and power hungry. And I'll, I'll sh we'll see why. Okay, so let's look at these different kinds. So the simplest one is a direct map cache. Again, we have a set size of one, so the sets are basically not existent, which means that, okay, we just use the index bits to index into this array of cache lines, and then we are done. Um, we just do the cache ma the, the tag match. So in this case, we have, say, four byte offset. Um, so that's a 16, no, yeah, 16 byte cache line. It's a relative small line size. And then a three bit cache index. So we have a total of eight sets. In this case, they're the same as lines. So it's a pretty small cache. And whatever that index bit pattern is, is the index into this array. And then you have your candidate line. In this case, that's the, the yellow line. And then we match the cache, uh, the, the tag we find there in this yellow line against the tag bits in the address. If they match, then we know we have a hit and we can access the, the data. Or if not, then we have a miss, OK? That understood? Good. So that's the direct map cache. And um, the next one is the set associative one. And for simplicity, we look at a two-way associative. So this is a cache of exactly the same size as the one before, except it's now two-way associative. So instead of having eight sets at one line each, we now have four sets at two lines each. So the set size is two. And um, the principle is, again, the same. We look at the index bits, index into this array of sets this time, right? So let's say the index is, of course, it's only two now because we have only four sets. So let's say the index gives a value of um, two, then that would be the red set. And then we use, we can match the tag against this tag. And if one of the matches, then we have a hit. If none of them matches, then we have a miss. What if two of them ma match? You get a very smoky CPU, basically. <laughs> <laughs> this would actually, this could physically destroy the CPU if this happened. But it doesn't happen because hardware doesn't allow this to happen, right? That's how the cache is imprinted. So basically, that case doesn't exist. OK. so. We use the index bit to select the set, and then we use the tag to find whether there is a match or not. So the, it's very similar um, in terms of lookup, except we now have to match two tags at the same time. Right? Before, the comparison was against one tag from one line. Now we have to ta compare two tags. In software, that means, OK, we have extra effort. In hardware, this is trivial to do parallel, right? Hardware parallelizes very nicely. We can do the, these two tag matches in parallel, and then we just need to find out um, whether, which one it is, and um, that will throw it out. So this is pretty straightforward, and that's um, what's usually implemented. OK, and then there is the, the full, as fully associative cache, in which case now we have only one set, which contains all the eight lines. So there's no more indexing actually happening 
there's no index bits, we now have to do the tag match across all the lines here. Okay, and this should probably tell you if you've done any sort of digital design courses or so, this is going to be pretty painful because you have a pretty deep logic to implement this multiple tag. Basically, the depth of your lookup logic is the log 2 of the set size. And so that makes it slow because you have to go through lots of gates. What is also the problem? Size, power. Size, um, that logic consumes a fair amount of space. Less of a problem these days. Power definitely is an issue because all these lookups happen in parallel and so you get a lot of gate switching in parallel at the same time. And that's why these tend to be pretty power hungry. And they, they just don't scale. And this is why you rarely see direct map, uh, full, fully associated caches, at least for CPU caches. Got it? Cool. Um, so, this is a really important. Has anyone not understood until this point? Because if you haven't understood that, then you won't be able to follow the rest. So that's critical. All good? No questions? Yeah? Um, if you miss in both cases, where is like, the virtual address meant, like, you need to access or pull it from any memory? Ah, that's a good point. Um, well, the virtual address you still have, right? So it depends a bit on whether we're indexing by virtual or by physical address, obviously. Uh, I haven't done this distinction yet, that will come next. But in principle, you still have the same address coming from memory, the one you use for indexing. That's the same one you use then for lookup, in principle. But it's not necessarily all that simple. Any other questions? Good. Um, so now it starts getting interesting because as I said, the real reason why I talk about this is that it actually has an impact on software. Caches are meant to be transparent. In reality, they're not completely. And one of the things here is that associativity and paging can interfere. So let's look at this cache, which has assume a page size of four kilobytes. So the page offset is how many bits? Hello. Hey? 12. Yeah, of course. Um, so we have a 12 bits page offset. So our virtual address in terms of paging is con uh, constructed from 12 offset bits and whatever, let's say, 32 bit architecture, 20 index um, page numbers bits, right? You have a 20 bit page number and 12 bit page offset. At the same time, we have this other structure imposed by caching of, in this case, 11 offset bits and four index bits. So this is a pretty funny cache, right? Only four sets, but um, pretty lo um, long lines. But let's just do that for the sake of argument, OK? So what does that mean? We, it means that the index bits are actually neither completely inside the page number nor inside the offset. So what's the implication here? No, not part of a cache line. Because the cache line is only indexed by the offset bits, which are completely contained inside the page offset, right? Now, the difference is somewhere else. Assume, are, are we talking virtual or physical addresses here? That's a question, right? At the moment, I haven't said that. What it means is that your index bit changes, it gets treated, different bits in the index field get treated differently by address translation. So the, the first part, the higher part, gets translated under address translation, whereas the lower part is invariant, OK? That tells us already one thing. If this, oh, crap. if this, um, if the index bits are completely contained inside the page offset, then the indexing is completely invariant under page translation, right? So then it doesn't matter whether we have a virtually indexed or physically indexed cache. It's actually 
that's where they unite. Right? It, it, you can't tell the difference because it's only the lookup only used the address bits that are invariant under address translation. In this particular case, we had a really funny structure where part of the index bits get translated by address translations and others not. So what are the implications here? We have, let's treat the two, look at them as if they were different things. They're all, obviously all part of the cache index, but they sort of have different implications. Um, if we now, if we just consider the two bits separately, then the top one determines whether we're looking at the line in the top half or the bottom half of the cache, right? Got that? And the other one then determines which of the sets inside that half. So this is a really interesting thing. What does that tell you? No. It means that, let's assume these are virtual addresses, OK? Um, it means that any datum that is on an even numbered page can only be cached in the top, in the lower half of the cache. I should have done them the other way around, to top and bottom, etc., at the lower address part of the cache. Whereas any address that's in a page with an odd virtual page number can only be cached in this bottom half here. So this is a funny interaction between caching and address translation, right? It means if you only use addresses on, say in an extreme case, you, you do your memory allocation, your virtual address space usage, so that you only use odd numbered virtual addresses or virtual page numbers you would get horrible cache utilization because you're not using a full half of the cache. Everything goes on this um, top part of the cache. So that's one implication. That's not the really concerning one. There's um, more later. So, um, so just keep those two terms in mind. The, this top part, which does get affected by address translation, we call the color. And you'll get to see in a second why. But basically, it means a page with a let's say we call them 0 and 1. Color of 0 can only end in the low address part of the cache and with a color 1 only in the high address part of the cache. So this now means that the cache actually colors me memory. And that's why it's called color. So in this case, we assume we have a cache of four colors, so just um, two bits that overlap with address translation. And anything that has the bit pattern 0, 0 in the page number, the vir virtual page number, or whatever page um, address is used here, let's assume it's virtual page number, can only lie in these blue parts of memory because they map onto the same part of the cache. Right? So our cache colors memory. We have certain parts of memory locations that can only lie in some part of the cache and other parts in memory that can only lie in a different part of the cache. So that means, in particular, addresses of different colors can never collide in the cache. So that's, a, in a way, a good thing. You can use that for performance isolation, and people actually do that. They use, say, memory coloring um, to avoid cache conflicts. And sometimes you can really have... I, extreme cache conflicts, which you then can resolve by arranging address space allocation, which is really weird. It typically applies to physical address space, not the virtual, so it's under control of the operating system. Um, so this is an important thing to understand, how the cache indexing structure affects um, how things, how different memory addresses can interact with each other. OK, so um, if we have, in general, C bits that overlap in the, between the cache index and the page number, then we have a, a cache of what's, what's called a cache of four colors. 
So in this case, it's two bits and it's a four colored cache. And therefore then we have in memory this uh, logical structure of four different colors distinguished by where they can be cached. So this is really interesting, right? Things that of different color can never interfere in the cache. They can never replace each other. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so we'll get back to that later because this actually has some really deep implications. So that's the, the basic theory of how caches operate. Now let's look at the, the policies that are needed. In the end, if you have a miss um, and you have to replace a line, then you have to apply some policy on how to do that, right? So a cache, um, if you have a, so this is important, if you have an n-way associative cache and then it can hold n lines of the same index and therefore if you have if your working set contains more than n lines with the same index, they collide in the cache, right? And they can't coexist all at the same time. And um, in general, there are four different kinds of cache misses. And I call those the four C's. And these you should really know. So if I wake you up at 2 a.m. and ask, what are the four C's? You should be able to rattle them off. <laughs> so what are they? Why do you miss in the cache? Most trivial one is? It's not there. It's not there. It's not there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's com called a compulsory miss, right? Data that never has been in the cache, obviously, is not in the cache, and it's a compulsory miss. So the first time you access any line, there's got to be a miss. That's a compulsory miss. OK? That's unavoidable. Next one. Um, no. Yeah. Sorry, cache is full. Yeah. The cache is of limited capacity. So eventually it's full and then you get a capacity miss. So capacity misses are also unavoidable because the cache has limited size. Um, and the capacity miss is basically defined in if your cache was the same size as RAM or logically infinite, you wouldn't have capacity misses. Right? You still have compulsory misses, you don't have capacity misses. So capacity misses are simply a result of the limited case side. Okay, that's the second C. What's the next one? I sort of explained it before. Yeah, if the set is full. It's a conflict miss, right? If you have more than the associativity of lines in the working set match, um, used in the cache, then they can't all coexist and the con then you get a conflict miss. So conflict miss is solely an artifact of the limited associativity of the cache. You will never have conflict misses in a fully associative cache by definition, right? F fully associative cache, you can only have capacity misses. So a conflict miss is a um, miss you wouldn't have in a fully associative uh, cache. It's a result of associativity. And these are the ones as far as I'm um, concerned for today, but there's also in multi-cores, there's coherence misses, where you have a hardware, typically uh, these days, a hardware coherence protocol that keeps caches consistent across cores. If you have um, core local caches, I'm not going to cover that today, but Kev will cover that when he talks about not the next two lectures. He talks, he'll talk about um, how to design systems on top of SEO4, but um, later when he comes back and talks about um, multi-core. Okay, so um, these are again, there's nothing you can do about it. That's sort of the limitations of the hardware we have to live with. But the question is, okay, if we have one of these misses, then obviously we need to fetch some data, right? It's easy. If we are lucky, and obviously the data goes into specified set. That's how the lookup works, right? That's what we explained before. And uh, in general, of course, the sets are full. If there, if there happens to be a line in the set that's not valid, then we could just load it in that one, no damage done, and we can just execute it. But in general, there, all the lines are in use, and then we have to determine which one do we throw out. And that's a policy. And this is sort of an unavoidable case of policy embedded in hardware. Generally, 
embedding policy in hardware is a bad idea because it's wired, right? You can't change it. And as always with policies, a good policy covers 90 or 95 percent of use cases well, but there's always a subset of use cases where it's really bad. And that's the general thing about policies, why, which is why it's bad to really hardwire them. But with cases, there's no choice because things have to be fast. They have to be the policy has to be implemented in hardware. Okay, so we do have a cache miss. We need to load a line from memory. The set is full. How do we determine which one to get rid of? Yeah, so what do those statistics use? I mean, you're right, but um, what, what, do you, what do you use them for? Well, yes, uh, you have to drive thing. In the end, what we want is to maintain locality, right? Because that drives the whole thing. So we want to make good use of the locality. How do we do that? You've heard these policies before. Least recently used tends to be the best one in the sense that um, it's the one that sort of does well in most use cases. It does not do well in all use cases. Like any other policy, it can be really pathological in some cases. What's a pathological case for least recently used? Uh, Explain. Yeah, if you have completely sequential access and importantly of more lines than there is space in the cache, then least recently used will always replace the one you're going to use next. So it's really when you have a loop, right? If you have a loop that accesses, say, you have n lines in the cache and you loop accesses n plus one line data sequentially, then least recently used will always toss the one you're next going to use. So it's the worst possible policy in that case. But in general, on average, it tends to be well. Um, so why is not everyone just in, uh, implementing LRU in the cache? Sometimes you don't have enough space because you might even store like a time step. Yeah, you're getting in the right direction. Um, least recently used needs a fair amount of metadata and um, it basically needs sort of a logarithm of the number of sets in bits to drive a state machine that keeps track on what's the least recently used one. Which is fine, it's trivial for two sets of size two because then it's just one or another. You just have to keep a bit that says which line was last accessed and uh, the, that's the recently used one and the other one is the one you toss. If you have more than two, it becomes more complex and in general slow. So LRU is always used on when your associativity is two. It's frequently used when your associativity is four. It's rarely used for bigger associativities because um, it, you basically come back to a similar story as why we don't use fully associative caches, right? If the associativity gets too big, you have to do too much in parallel and LRU is similar. So, what people tend to use is pseudo LRU, which is sort of some simplified state machine that keeps um, an approximation of LRU. Some people use, uh, some implementations use FIFO. Does anyone yell? So FIFO, in a way, is the opposite of LRU, right? Um, it works well in the cases where LRU is pathological, but that's a small subset. So that's in, in generally, that's a pretty dumb policy, but still gets implemented. Um, and then there's various versions of random. Any comments on that? Is there such a thing as random though? That's a fair point, yeah. I mean, hardware by and large is highly deterministic, right? Um, and we like it that way. There's actually, uh, once we lose determinism in computers, things get really ugly really quickly. So true random is generally not used because it actually gets, takes effort to produce true, ra true randomness in computers. Um, when someone sells you a cache that has random replacement, it typically means it's actually undisclosed what the algorithm is and it's 
typically something fairly simple. Um, so some very simple state machine that's maybe driven off the program counter or something like that. Uh, program counter or just in cycle counter typically. Um, so basically that means the hardware manufacturer takes the easy route out and doesn't want to document it, which is nice because that means they can change it, etc. Once it's architected, it becomes a bit of harder to change. Uh, generally, it's a pretty poor um, policy, in particular when you worry about real-time performance as we do or timing channel prevention as we do, random is really awful. Um, but it's actually uh, pretty popular these days. And then the sort of um, orthogonal one is toss clean. So if you means if you have a clean line in the cache, toss that one first because it's cheap to throw out. Um, whether that's a good policy or not is a different question, right? Because the read-only data may actually be pretty hot. Um, but these are the policies that implement. In general, the, the main takeaway is it's got to be a very small hardware um, circuit that drives this, typically a, a small state machine, and it's got to be really simple, and therefore um, it, there tend to be relatively simple policies. So typically pseudo LIU or random. Good. Questions? No. So that was the replacement policy. The other important policy is the write policy. So if you write to store to the cache, to a cache line, what does the cache do? Does it immediately send it off to memory or does it hold it back until the cache line gets replaced? And these there are two basic policies, the write back is the, first, is the second one where cache just accumulates writes and eventually when the line is flushed it gets written out and the write through is a write that hits the cache will immediately uh, be transferred to memory. Um, okay, I'll actually give, all, give everything away because it's pretty obvious, right? The, the write back is really what you want because it does the clustering of writes and therefore we if, is much more effective at reducing memory transactions, which is the ultimate goal, right? That's the, where we get performance from. Um, the write-through has the advantage that the cache remains consistent with memory. So that's why they were fairly um, popular for a while with early micro-cores, sorry, multi-cores, uh, because then um, you don't need a cache coherency protocol to keep caches consistent because they always are and um, automatically because the cache is consistent with memory, but their performance is poor and that's why people have gone away from it. You were first. So, there's no mention there about data protection and I assume because we're still not talking about writing it to disk or anything like that, we're still writing it back to volatile right. memory. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah, protection is a separate issue which I'll get to. Yeah. System is in a single core, there's no absolute no reason why you would want to write through cache. You just use a white. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Was it, is there ever a reason where memory is thinking system the cache actually bad in single core? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then the other policy is the allocate policy. What happens if you have a store to a line that is not in cache? And there is the write allocate or no allocate. Um, write allocate means, okay, if there's a store, then we ca do cache it. That means we may have to first replace a line, send it back to memory, make space, and then um, write in there. Or no allocate, just bypass the cache, send it to memory. Um, what's the trade-off here? Yes, if it's pretty inefficient, if you write multiple words to the same cache line, right? You have a, a memory transaction for each of them. That's definitely true. Um, the opposite thing is you may or may not be able to buffer writes better um, than in the right allocate because in the right allocate, you just have to wait until you have a free cache line which if you don't have a clean one to toss, it means first 
there has to be a write back of a cache line and then a write to the cache definitely stalls until the, the line is freed. So the, the no allocate may better hide the write latencies. That's not quite obvious. It's a bit more tricky than that. Um, but basically, write back and write allocate go together. And for the same reason that these days almost all caches are write back, um, they tend to be write allocate as well. Uh, whereas write through mostly makes sense, uh, no allocate ma mostly makes sense on a write through cache. So these days it's pretty much the top one, write back and write allocate. Okay? Good. Any questions up to this point? It would be a good space for a break, but I'll go keep going for another five minutes. All right. So, next thing to look is cache indexing. You probably thought we covered that already, but remember what outstanding issue did we have? I didn't really talk anything more about whether we're using virtual addresses or physical addresses, right? And in general, um, there's no reason that, the in, that you can only use one, even in the same cache. Because you really have, you use the address twice. You use the address for indexing, and you use the address for tag matching. And my assumption so far has been that it's the same, same address. You take the tag from the same address as the index. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, and there's four possible combinations. There's the virtually index, virtually tag cache, the so-called VV cache, that uses the virtual address for both. And then there's the virtually index physically tag cache, the VP cache. So this one uses the virtual address for indexing, but the physical address for tagging. Why would that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're right that um, locality tends to be better in virtual than in physical addresses. Um, but that's not the issue here because the um, difference is obviously at the page granularity and most of the indexing is really inside the page. Now the, yeah? Um, could the physical tagging remove any ambiguity or duplicates with, um, could physically tag, using physically tag, prevent um, duplicate tags within the Yep, that, that's, a, that's an important point. But also the other one, remember, what was the advantage of using virtual addresses for indexing in the first place? You actually put your finger on a, on a pretty important point, which I'll get to. But before that, um, what was the main advantage? Why do we bother virtual index caches? You don't have to wait for the translation to arrive, right? Now... The virtually index physically tag gives you some of the advantage of the virtual indexing, but then by the time you do the tagging, maybe you have the physical address already, in which case you, have, you basically have advantage of physical caches, which I get to, without um, the drawbacks of virtually index caches. So um, the physically indexed virtually tag seems to be in incredibly crazy. Sun Microsystems actually built a system that had um, PV caches, <laughs> but that's the only one I've ever seen. There was one particular model of Sun processors that had um, VP PV caches. It's a crazy architecture. Uh, typically, these days, the trend is towards PP caches, for reasons we'll see. Um, VV caches are almost completely gone. I don't know any recent processor that uses them. So it's either VP or PP. And um, I'll talk about the various drawbacks and trade-offs after the break. Questions at this point? Nope. All right, 10 minutes break. Cool. Welcome back. OK, so now let's go through these uh, different schemes. The, the first one, the VV cache, virtually tagged, virtually indexed. 
goes under all sorts of funny names. Virtually dress cache, that's insensible. Virtual cache is not, because that would be a cache that seems to be there but isn't. Um, and the virtual address case is also uh, cache is also nonsensical because that would be something that caches virtual addresses, right? Um, so, as we noticed before, this can operate concurrently with the MMU. In theory, um, where's the catch here? Comes back what you said. I think it was. Or you, you, you still have the address, right? Simultaneously operating processes operates use the same virtual addresses, especially when they're massive physical LPs. Yeah, so where is the access control here, right? Where do, you, where do you get the access control from? What tells whether you're allowed to write or read from a page? The MMU, yeah. So basically, you can't completely divorce this from the MMU because whether you're allowed to actually access the line you found determines on the MMU. So you still have to wait for that one for the permissions. In general, so that, that loses some of the speed advantage, okay? You can still do the MMU lookup in concurrently with the cache lookup, and that sort of saves some time. And hopefully, by the time you actually found your line and did the tank comparison, you know, you have the MMU result and then have to go back and check whether that's a valid thing. It actually complicates the implementation to a degree because you sort of have to feed back into the cache lookup from the MMU. Um, and that sort of undermines some of the advantages of these um, L1 uh, VV caches. For the reasons I said earlier, they're only useful for the L1 cache because by the time you get to even start looking up the L2, the MMU will have delivered the address translation already. Um, and then there's the virtual index which physically tagged. So here we use the virtual index to look up the cache and then wait for the MMU to deliver a tag bit and do the tag comparison with that one. All right? So what's the implication? There's several, obviously. Let's look for some. <laughs> we use a different address for the tag matching than for the indexing. Remember, what, were the, what did we use as the tag bits? The bits of the virtual address which were not used for indexing, right? We can't do this here. Because it's a different address and it changes on the address translation. And different virtual pages can map on the same, on the same physical page, or this different, it's the same virtual address can map on different physical pages, etc. So we need the tag for the tagging here because part of it or all of it gets changed on the address translation. We need to tag with the full set of bits that are not used for the line offset. So we can't just use the top order bits that are not been used for indexing, but we need to have use the whole thing. So the tags are bigger in this case because we can't just drop the bits we use for indexing. Before that, that lower part of the address was implicit in the position of the line we just found, right? That's no longer the case here. So we have bigger tags. Um, and then there's the physically indexed, you notice I not even bother with the PI cache, the bizarre one, the physically indexed, physical tagged one. Um, that one is pretty straightforward. It just works as before. We use, we have the separate tag and index bits and uh, we use the lower, the index bits for indexing and the others for tagging. So this one is definitely the thing to use for anything other than the L1, because we do have the result of the address translation. But there's actually the case, which I indicated earlier, where the dif distinction vanishes. And this is when the index bits are completely inside 
the page offset, in which case they're invariant under address translation, and therefore there's no more difference between virtual and physical address lookup because we use part for, of the address that doesn't get translated. So these are the nice caches, and this is what Intel uses exclusively for the L1 cache these days. So ever wondered why the, in the, the um, L1 cache on Intel architectures tends to be 32 kilobyte with an associ associativity of eight? For exactly that reason, because you then have your cache index bits completely contained in a page offset and you have this nice kind of cache where you even you don't have to wait for the address translation, yet it has all the behavior of a physically addressed cache. So that documentation will say it's a physically addressed cache, which is sort of, it behaves like one, but um, basically the distinction vanishes. So the implication of that is this is a single color cache. So if you look at um, Intel architectures, you will inevitably find that the L1 cache has a single color, which means it has this advantage that um, the, you don't, it behaves like a physically addressed cache without waiting, having to wait for the address translation. ARM is actually, some ARM processes use that one, others are different and I'll get to show you an example. Now, why do we bother with this? I promised you there is actually effects on uh, that we need to be aware of. So in principle, the cache is meant to be just this transparent performance enhancer, which you don't really need to worry about. Um, so you can ignore its existence, right? Well, not quite. Why can't you ignore the cache? Right. So, as I said, anything in operating systems is either about security or performance. It's actually also about correctness, which you can sort of throw under security if you like. If something is not correct, then it's certainly not secure. Um, so, if we always worry about performance, and therefore we do need to worry about caches for the same reason why we need to worry about virtual memory, right? A similar thing, virtual memory is supposed to be transparent to software. Well, it is except for performance. And if you use a particular VM unfriendly cache layout that spreads your data over the maximum number of pages, then you get pretty horrible performance from your virtual memory system. Similar here with a cache. If you have data that is packed nicely into cache lines, they, and you avoid conflict misses, then you get the best performance from your cache, otherwise the cache is degraded, right? By basically um, uh, extra misses. It's actually worse. Depending on your cache architecture, and this is why it's important to understand those, it may actually affect correctness. Now this seem, may seem strange, but it's actually the case. So performance obviously, but also correctness. And this, um, just basically, correctness can be affected if you have either homonyms or synonyms. What are those? So homonym, that comes from Greek. Um, homos, something, same. Um, they have the, the same name. Basically, a homonym is things, different things with the same name. So in, that means data that has um, the same name for different, actually referencing different data. And of course, where do you get that? pretty standard, right? In a Unix system, every address space has basically the same layout, so you use the same virtual addresses, but they refer to completely different data. So this is an example here, two address spaces, both use this page A, so that's the same name, but of course they reference different data. They're meant to reference different data. If not, then you have a problem. Um, and this can, if you have this, which of course is pretty standard, then that can produce correctness issues with caching. And the others is synonyms or aliases. So these are s s multiple names for the same thing. In this case, multiple addresses referring to the same data. And that can also have correctness issue with caches. So synonyms you can have within an address space when a mo the same 
frame is mapped multiple times in your address space, or more likely when sharing data across address spaces using shared buffers, where the same frame is mapped into multiple address spaces. Okay, let's have a look at these. With the VV cache, these are the, they, they all appear there. And that's why VV caches have really gone out of fashion. So the VV cache is, remember, indexed only by virtual address. Now virtual address, as we just seen, is not a unique identifier because the virtual address is only relevant to the particular address space. But the cache doesn't know anything about your address spaces. All it knows about is virtual addresses. So from different, um, different address spaces, you access data in the cache by virtual address. Do you, where do you know whether that's the right data for you to use, right? Whether it's your data or some other process's data. So this is the homonym problem in the cache with VV caches. Um, and basically, if you have an architecture with VV caches, unless you restrict your virtual memory layout, which is what we've done in the past, then you have to flush the cache on a context switch. Right? So that's a bit painful. And um, as I said, they are pretty much gone these days, but they used to be prominent in the past, particularly on ARM processors. And um, we have shown that you... Basically, Linux which flush the cache on every context switch in extreme cases could get a factor of 50 performance degradation. That's a sort of constructed case, right? It's a worst case compared to a system that over enforces non-overlapping virtual address space layout, which in general on the 32-bit processor is a bit of a challenge, right? You're fairly limited. It worked 15 years ago with the... Um, um, embedded systems of those times because they were inherently very resource limited. They didn't have these large address spaces, etc. So you could share 32-bit virtual address space between multiple processes. These days, that's out of the question. And um, so because of these issues, the VV caches are not used anymore. As I said, I don't remember recent architecture that has them. Um, how about synonyms? So synonyms is when the same frame is mapped multiple times in the same or different address space. And um, the problem here is similar that you may access stale data because since the lookup happens by virtual address, the place where some datum lives in the virtual address in the cache is determined by the virtual address. And if you have several, several virtual addresses referring to the same data, which is what you have with synonyms, then something can get cached in different page parts of the cache. What's the requirement on the cache for this to happen? No, it has nothing to do with right back. Nope. Uh, yeah, okay, if you have a write back cache, then presumably that's Ben 9. Yep, okay, I take that. Um, so if it's a, sorry, if it's a write through cache, then that's Ben 9. If it's a write back cache, then it's a potential problem. Yes, you're right. Um, what other prerequisite on the cache? Remember, this happens only if multiple virtual pages refer to the same physical frame. And how does that relate to what I told you earlier? No, nothing to do with that. Remember, we had saw one case where sort of address translation and cache indexing interfere, which was. When, when, you, when your cache has multiple colors, right? Because the index bits overlap with the page number. So if you have a single color cache, then this is not an issue, which comes back to the case that the single color is the cache where 
there's no difference between physical and virtual indexing. So if you like, it's not a, in this category. But if you have a cache with multiple colors, then synonyms create a problem. OK. Um, and of course, yeah, it's not, it's not an issue if your case is right through or in general if all the data, if the, the synonyms are only read-only data, which is in a way for the, the write-through case, right? It doesn't ever contain sturdy data. Um, so for instructions, for example, that's harmless. And this is why you, if you look at the Intel caches, they have 32 kilobytes, um, you will find that the physically, uh, the, the data cache typically has a single color, whereas the instruction case often has multiple colors because they're harmless. So that the instruction case typically, cache typically has a lower associativity than the data cache. That's again, not a law of nature. This is just um, has to do with um, how to make them fast, and et cetera, and uh, sort of what the, the typical access patterns and all that, yep. I might be misremembering what write through cases do, but I was wondering if, like, if you already have you know, two, two entries like of different colors, and one of them was written to, like, it wouldn't, up, like, the other one still wouldn't be updated, would it? Well, that's the problem, right? Still get that's exactly the problem, yes. So, um, and there's a real example. MIPS R4600, this was the first architecture on which we built an L4 kernel and was also the first used in advanced OS. Um, so this was one of the first 64-bit processes in the early 90s. And it had this two-color cache. So it had a um, virtually index physically tagged cache on chip. Um, and it was ACID tagged, so you could distinguish address spaces. And um, it was 16 kilobytes, two-way set associative. So that gives you two colors, right? And that means the highest index bit of the, the hi highest index bit is part of the page number and gets translated under address translation, which is basically the example I've given you before. And um, so, it has two colors, and therefore we have this issue that if two processes access the same page, and the page happens to be mapped with different colors in the two processes, then we have a synonym problem because if the one accesses it with a zero color and the that means it has to be cached in the top half of the cache. If the other access with a one color, it forces it in the lower part of the cache. And therefore, the same line can be in the cache twice. And you can have a synonym problem that creates inconsistency. So this is what happens here. Um, we have the same frame, which is either once mapped as a green page and once as a blue page. And they're by, that means if address space one accesses it, it has to be in the green part of the cache. If um, address space two accesses it, it has to be in the blue part of the cache. And therefore, it's potentially replicated in the cache. And so what's the problem here? Well, um, they, can, they, they, they can become inconsistent. So if one is written back, and the other not, then that um, memory is incoherent with the cache, and part of the one line in the cache is incoherent with the other part in the cache. And so that means um, you can have a lost update problem. You have the same with DMA, because DMA typically bypasses the cache. It goes directly to physical memory. And it's, that's pretty obvious on how these things are constructed, right? The, the DMA accesses the memory bus fairly low down in the hierarchy. Um, the L1 cache is always on core, and so you, the I.O. can't get directly there, so it has to pretty much bypass at least the L1 cache. And um, that means you can have inconsistency between the, the cache and what's in memory and what's seen by DMA. This is why when you do DMA, we have to really careful to make, 
with cache maintenance. So before anything gets read by the I.O. device for output, you have to flush the data from the cache into main memory. And similarly, before you read anything, you have to make sure that it's flushed from the, it's clean in the cache at least, before otherwise it could, what's presently dirty in the cache could override what the DMA device has read into memory in the meantime. Now, oh, I meant to remove this, sorry. Um, unfortunately, we make your life too easy because the network driver we give you does all the cache management, so unfortunately you don't have to deal with that. I think this is wrong. But um, so you don't actually have to deal with it. It's hidden in your um, device driver. So what are the issues here when we have a dirty line here? Assume we have a synonym in the cache. One of them is dirty, the other is clean. Um, we unmap it, and then um, remap the same page again. And eventually, the dirty line gets flushed out to, out to memory, and suddenly memory changes, even though it's really not mapped anymore, etc. And that's called, called a cache bomb. <laughs> So this thing is there sitting, this dirty line sitting in the cache and ticking along until some point where it suddenly gets replaced and then memory changes apparently randomly. So that's a pretty bad problem to have. So um, the, the way to avoid synonyms, the easy one is just to flush on a context switch, which doesn't actually help for synonyms within the address space. Um, hardware synonym detection or um, mapping restricting mapping so you maintain the col color in mappings. Basically that means you map odd, page, odd virtual pages onto odd frames and even virtual pages on even frames. So restrict the liberty of memory mapping and therefore enforcing by software basically that this lower order bit in the page number that's used for address uh, for cache lookup remains uh, invariant under address translation. So that's a invariance imposed by the operating system by managing its mapping and that avoids synonym problems. Um, the other is hardware synonym detection which is used on some ARM processors. So if you look at for example the A53 which is a fairly recent not quite last generation ARM processor um, you'll see that its cache actually its L1 data cache has two colors. So the question is do you need to worry about um, synonym problems in the cache here. Well, ARM's manual actually tells you they have a virtually index, a physically indexed cache, so you shouldn't have to worry. ARM is actually lying there. The cache is not physically indexed, but it behaves like a physically indexed cache. So they, even though they have a virtually indexed physically tag cache, they actually make it behave as it was physically indexed. And they do that by using extra hardware to detect and deal with those synonyms. So basically what it means is when we do, when it does an indexing operation, so again you have the two parts of the index bit, the color and the subset within the color, then instead of just looking at up the set inside the right color, it actually looks up both colors. So irrespective of the value of this upper bit, it does the look up both sides and then detects whether there is a synonym there. And um, if it detects a synonym, obviously if it's a read access, then nothing needs to be done. But if it's a write access, it will actually update both synonyms. So it does the lookup of both sets, does the tag match from both sets. If both sets match in their tag, then it will perform the update in both um, lines and um, therefore enforce the consistency of these synonyms and in that sense the cache behaves like a physically indexed one. Does this have like any performance penalty? Say again? Does this have a noticeable performance penalty? Because you're not doing twice as much work. Um, okay, if you have lots of synonyms then you would reduce the usable size of the cache effectively. 
that is true. Um, in practice, I don't think that's a big deal. The performance overhead is the lookup logic is more complicated, and that means potentially slower, but presumably they get it to work, right? The important thing about cache designs these days is your lookup has to basically be happening at CPU speed, so within one cycle. And as long as they can manage to do that, then they're fine. All right, so VV caches are actually dangerous because they have both synonym and homonym problems, and uh, they're painful, and these days... The reason why they were used at all is basically um, in those days, a while back, where simple processors had only one level of cache, then you want to, if you only have one level of cache, you really want to make it as big as possible because otherwise you don't really get the right match in speed um, because it's a trade-off of access speed and size of the cache to, to really balance that. Um, as long as you had only one level of cache, they needed to be reasonably big, and then you're forced to pretty much use virtually indexing. Um, these days, everything else has at least two levels of caches, and therefore architects can afford to keep the first level small enough that it only has one color, and this problem all goes away. So this is what you have to deal with these days, typically, or use the ARM trick in uh, enforcing synonym detection. Yep. So for the protection bits, you basically you, you have to wait until you have the address translation and therefore the access bits and show that um, this address is actually a valid one to access. Was that your question? Oh. Ah, for providing, yeah, yeah, okay, sorry, I didn't go into this. Um, we experimented with this cache design a while ago where you basically have um, in some way encoded access bits inside the cache. The access bits themselves is actually not really a good idea because, again, the address is depend on the address space, so when you switch address spaces, that becomes stale as well. Um, so that, there was some indirection where you basically refer to an object ID and then you have a separate cache wall that gives you, tells you whether you have access to objects, etc. Um, it was a nice idea. These days it's sort of not really worth bothering anymore because um, people just don't use VV caches anymore. Um, and then AC tag VV caches. So this is when you basically logically extend the virtual address to make it global by adding a virtual address space bits. And then you get rid of the homonyms, but still have the synonyms. And then the virtually index physically tagged. Again, they have no homonym problem, but they have still the synonyms. And um, again, you either have what the ARM does, the synonym detection to enforce consistency, or make sure that your virtually index cache only has one color, in which case you have no problem. And then the, the PP caches, they're easy. They're just, you don't have to worry anything. Um, and this is where the, the trend is these days. Obviously, as I said earlier, anything other than the L1 is always PP anyway. Um, but these days we have generally these either p really physically index caches or in practice the, the ones that have just um, a single color and therefore behave like physically indexed. Sorry? Is the L1 cache usually like VV or VG? Uh, um, yeah. Is the I, L1 usually like a VG cache or VG cache? The L1? Yeah. Well, as I said, these days it's almost always a cache of a single color and therefore the distinction goes away. That's what you find in Intel. With the exception of these ARM processors that have two colors and are virtually indexed physically tagged, but hardware synonym detection prevents any visible um, syn synonym effects by keeping them coherent. And when Kev talks about multi-core issues, he'll talk about coherency protocols, etc. 
um, and they use snooping, basically when a memory access happens, check whether the same thing is in a different cache. And their snooping caches are difficult to do with virtually indexing, and that's another reason why there's this trend to physically index caches. But KEF will cover that. OK. Um, and as I said, it's the exclusive for the lower caches. So this was the principles of caches. Um, and sort of what, what you really need to understand about cache addressing, etc. A little bit of sort of implications of the fact that we these have hierarchies these days. So let's look at um, what what um, cache hierarchies imply. One of the thing is that these days, almost always, you not only have a cache, you also have a store buffer. So what's the idea here? If you have a write on a cache line, say you're trying to write to the L2. Um, that takes a while, and you don't want to stall the process until that write has been completed on the L2 cache, and even worse when it goes to memory, because that could be a long time. Um, instead, there's a separate data structure, the so-called write buffer, that, trans that buffers those writes until they hit the destination, and you can actually the CPU can actually continue operating. If you don't have a write buffer, then Whenever you have a um, write transaction, for example, a write miss on the L1, your CPU is stalled until the write completes. So that's a simple FIFO buffer where things go on one side and then they come out on the other side. And that's fine and it's completely transparent unless you have multi-cores. If, um, if, if that's the full story, then it would be even fine with multi-cores. Um, but of course the question is, right, I have these items A, B, and C in this write buffer, and now I'm accessing A again. Um, do I really want to wait until it comes out the other side? Because it's in there already, right? We might as well fetch it from there. That's fine. Um, but the problem is that when you do that, then you get into what's called weak memory um, models because then this CPU sees other data than the other CPU that accesses the same cache. Because that CPU, when it fetches things out of the store buffer, will see a value of the data which is not visible at the cache yet and therefore not visible for the other core that accesses the same cache. And that's behind weak memory models. So weak memory models are basically a result of using white buffers. And again, Kev will talk about um, multi-core issues in detail, so I'll, I'll just mention this here. Um, and then, in general, as I said, you have a cache hierarchy, so this is typically what um, a lot of Intel processes look like. You have L1 caches, you have L2, L3, and um, then you have memory. There's typically a write buffer between each level of the hierarchy for the reasons I explained, so in a three-level cache hierarchy, you have three write buffers. Um, you almost always have separate instruction data caches. Why is that? It's a so-called Harvard architecture. Um, so, it basically makes the cache architecture more efficient because, um, as you quite rightly observed, you normally have, you need an instruction fetch on every instruction, so every instruction will do a read from the instruction cache, and in addition, most instructions will access the data cache. And you can have dual ported memory where multiple accesses can happen at the same time, but it's much simpler and more efficient to keep them separate. And in reality, these days, we've long gone off modifying code until people reinvented it in Java virtual machines, of course. But um, this just-in-time compilation is a separate story. It can be dealt with separately. Um, we generally don't sort of mix data and instructions. And therefore, keeping them in 
separate caches is a good way to make the caching more efficient because you just have a simple ca iCache that just needs one access every cycle. Okay, more if you have multi-issue architectures, but um, even multi-issues, it's basically you fetch one line at this time and um, can really simplify the iCache and therefore make it cheaper and um, uh, bigger for the same silicon real estate. And similar with the D cache, it max, at max has two accesses per cycle, typically a, a data fetch and a data write. Um, but again, you need you get a, you don't have this issue of multiple access ports to the same cache because they are expensive. If you just think how you would realize that in hardware, it's a huge amount of extra complexity in the the memory structure. Um, so. The, this idea of the Harvard architecture where the data and instruction come from different memories, which goes back to um, really some of the first generation computers where they actually had the um, separate memories for data and instructions. And it's the, the notion of the von Neumann computer that you, you mix them up, right? It's, it's just one memory. Well, in terms of what the CPU the core actually sees, it is a Harvard architecture and said there's two different memories. Of course, they fetch in the end from the same physical memory and everything down from the L2 on is, um, uh, tends to be unified, but you have at the L1 level pretty consistently this uh, Harvard architecture of distinguishing between I and D. There's other arch um, reasons as well. The I cache is purely read only. We only read instructions, we don't write them. And again, it can be differently optimized from the D cache. So it makes a lot of sense to keep them separate. Um, and then we have typically, yeah, if you have a multi-core, the last level cache tends to be uni uh, shared between all the cores. Um, if you have more than two levels, what happens to the level two depends on manufacturer. So Intel typically has private L2 caches, so every core has its own L2, and only the L3 is unified. AMD typically has the L2 shared between a small cluster of cores, so about four cores or so, and the L3 um, shared across everything. And um, um, there's probably by now three level um, caches on high-end ARM power, so I haven't actually looked at what they look like. But so, t main takeaway is the L2 cache can be either core local. The, the L1 cache is always core local. It's actually on the core. The L2 cache um, tends to be core private or shared between a small cluster of cores. And the L3 tends to be um, shared between all cores. And so your Odroid is an example. So this is the A53. So it actually has this two colored L1 D cache, which you don't see. Um, and it has for each core a has a private L1 I cache and an L1 D cache, and then there's a shared L2 cache. And devices hang off the main memory bus, so they by bypass the cache. And Intel actually keeps the caches consistent with DMA. So if DMA um, access RAM, then it makes sure that the the cache hierarchy remains consistent with DMA, so you don't have to worry about that. In the ARM case, that's not the case, so it needs to be keep kept explicitly consistent. And in your case, you have um, 32 kilobyte L1 caches, and you can see what I said before, the L1i is a two-way, and the L1d is a four-way. So that means the L1d has two colors, the L1i actually has four colors, but the number of colors don't matter for the L1, for the I cache, because it only has uh, read-only data, and therefore consistency is not a problem. And the D cache is made to look like a physically indexed cache is by hardware synonym detection. And then the L2 is a half a megabyte, 16-way. And it's also typical. The further down you go, the higher the associativity, which makes sense because bigger associative lookup, for the reasons I explained earlier, is more expensive, more power-hungry, and takes longer, but the L2 and lower caches are, take much longer to access anyway, so you can afford to have, uh, to take a bit more time in doing a bigger associative lookup, 
at the, with the benefit of then getting fewer um, conflict misses and therefore overall better cache performance. So all these are sort of difficult trade-offs which the um, architects play around with. We don't have to worry, we just have to accept that, okay, if we have multicolored L1 cache, we have to be careful. So this is a, I, has all been about CPU caches, so caches for instructions and data. There's one other important cache you have on the system, which you are aware of, and that's the TLB. In reality, there's more caches of various sorts. For example, the branch predictors has all sorts of caching involved, etc. But that's really, unless you worry about timing channels, as we do, um, you can ignore them completely. They're really transparent. Um, the TLB, of course, you have to be aware of because this cache is page translation, right? So the TLB is a cache for page table entries. The data and instruction caches are caches for memory words, uh, whereas the TLB is a cache for translations, which are really defined by the page table entry. So what the TLB is, it's a form of a virtually indexed, virtually cache uh, tagged cache. So in that sense, the VVE caches are still around, but only for the case of the TLB. And of course, to first order, the TLB contains read-only data because um, it caches page table entries and they only change if you explicitly remap a page. And of course, when you remap a page, then you can get stale data in the TLB. If you unmap a page, then it's still cached in the TLB, so you need to explicitly flush it from the TLB. Um, the kernel does that for you, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, but if you design the kernel, then you need to worry about this sort of thing. So it's a VV cache, meaning it uses virtual page numbers for indexing as well as tagging. And the payload is not data word, it's translation information. So physical frame numbers and flags that basically determine access rights and caching. Um, typically these days, TLBs are hardware loaded. Uh, software loaded TLBs were popular among early 64-bit processors uh, because people weren't quite sure how to get them, what the best architecture was to make them fast and they left it to software for good reasons. Uh, but these days, I don't know any recent processor that has a software-loaded TLB. Some power, embedded power PCs, I still think, still use them, but they're low-end processors. So almost always it's hardware-loaded, meaning you don't really have to worry too much about it. The um, MMU, when it looks for an address translation, looks it up in the TLB. If it's not there, it's a TLB miss. It reads it from the page table. That itself may be cached. Intel uses caching very aggressively, um, but it's just a cache for translation information. TLBs themselves can be split into I and D TLBs for similar reasons, pretty much like we have the Harvard architecture for instruction and data cache, because typically on most instructions, we need to resolve an instruction address and a data address and that's more efficient to have them separate. And um, this is an interesting table of TLB sizes over the past, what is it, um, 30 odd years? The VAX 11 was, I believe, the first processor with a TLB. So this is vintage around, no, 40 years, around 80, 81. And it had a small page size, half a kilobyte. It seems that's the only less than a kilobyte page size in the, in the whole table. Um, very low associativity of two, and size that varied from 64 to 256. These days, of course, page, base page size of four kilobytes is pretty standard. And the t number of TLB entries is off the order of 100, typically. So 100. Uh, 128 is pretty normal. Um, the, some Intel processors have a pretty large, big stage two TLB, but sort of off, off the order of 100 
is typical. And this is pretty much like at the beginning, 40 years ago. And so the, the page size went up by a factor of eight, but that was pretty early on. But for the last 35 years or so, TOBs basically haven't grown. Now this is in March, in vast contrast to working set size, which have grown massively, right? In those days of the VAX, um, 64 kilobytes was a huge memory. <laughs> and of course, that was all completely mapped by the TOB. These days we have terabytes of memory and with a base page size of four kilobytes, the TOB only maps one megabyte. So that's a tiny fraction of memory. So uh, how does this possible, how can this possibly work? Because we need the TLB lookup on every address translation of any, every memory access, but the TLB covers only this tiny bit of memory. And not surprisingly, there are benchmarks where TLB reloads make up to 40% of the runtime because they're basically th thrashing the TLB. Now, the story is not quite as bad as it sounds here um, because people have, well, for one thing, if you look back at the table, you can see some of these TLBs actually support multiple page sizes. Uh, that started in the early 90s. The MIPS, I think, was one of the early ones with multiple page sizes. Um, turns out operating system designers found it very difficult to use these different page sizes effectively. And state of the art in Linux is pretty much you have this your huge TLB region, which is basically a big region of memory, which is mapped with a bigger page size. And beyond that, it's not really used because it's actually really hard to use efficiently. Um, so how do we get around this? Uh, bottleneck is by having multiple level of TLBs, similar as with caches. So that's pretty standard these days to have a two level TLB, where the first one is often really tiny and the second one can be quite big. Um, and when I say tiny, I mean it. Sometimes you find the level one TLB is only two entries for the IK, ITLB and four for the DTLB. So that's really small. The important point here is you want the TLB, the, the address translation to happen in a single cycle because otherwise that would slow down everything. And you can do that if the TLB is really small and then you can afford it to be fully associative, etc. cetera. And, um, but that only works with really small TLB, so you need to have a much bigger level two TLB to back it up. And um, that's sort of how it's done typically these days. So Intel Core i7, that's a recent Intel processor. Um, you can see that there's actually four level one TLBs. It supports two page sizes, four kilobytes and 24 megabytes, and there's a TLB for each of these page sizes, an ITLB and a DTLB for each of these page sizes, and they load from a unified um, level two TLB that only maps still four kilobyte pages and have 512 entries. That's still not a lot, right? And so how can they possibly make this work? Because if you have a big working si set, this is going to have TLB misses at a very rapid rate. And so the key then is make TLB reloads really fast. And this is why they, some, some architecture have special TLB caches, which is sort of like a third level TLB. Others are caching the TLB entries in the data cache, etc. Uh, various tricks are used. Here's the your ARM 53 which has, supports a range of page sizes um, in multiples of, in powers of 16, I think, um, where the level one is fair number of entries, 10 of them. Um, I think it's fully associative because 10 entries sort of only makes sense with fully associativity. And then a, um, a still very highly associative t level two TLB um, that's much bigger. And so this is what the real memory architecture looks like. So the Intel Haswell, which is a few years old, um, 
you can see it's got caches all over the place. There's the, the ITOB and there is a STOB, which is the secondary TOB. Somewhere there needs should be a DTOB. Can't spot it right now. Oh, here is a DTOB. Then there's an L1 data cache, the L2 cache, the L3 cache, the L1 instruction cache, and then a few other bits and, so, and pieces. So lots of caches. And this is a simplified view of the architecture. And uh, Intel has well introduced what's called a slice steel uh, cache. So its last level cache is architecturally unified, but in reality it's not. It's distributed between clusters of cores. They have slices that are associated with cores. And then there's a hardware logic that makes that completely transparent, mostly. But still, if you, have, if you access data from your own slice, it's faster than from a remote slice. And that can also be used for timing channels, etc. Um, that's it for today. Any questions up to this point? Yeah, um, project questions, I don't know whether I'm necessarily the right person, but uh, you can ask it anyway. <laughs> Before we go there, just a reminder, so if anyone wants to run off, um, there's a prize for the top performer in this course, which is now sponsored by Arista. And there's also the Hall of Fame prize, if you manage to HD OS, AOS, and an OS thesis, and distribute it provided it's running, which it may not this year, <laughs> um, then you get an official Hall of Fame prize in your uh, uh, OS Hall of Fame prize in your transcript, not just cash, but it's in your transcript. And you can put that on your CV. And, and we provide taste of research, in cool taste of research projects.